Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 11E. We we're going to continue our discussion of epigenetic regulation, focusing on a particularly interesting, exciting phenomenon called genomic imprinting. We'll talk about what it is, we'll talk about its function, which is explained best by an evolutionary hypothesis called parental conflict theory. We'll talk about diseases that are affected by imprinting, and we'll learn how to analyze pedigrees that involve the effects of the imprinting. So we'll start with a slide from Module 8 that recapped some of the things that Mendel found out about peas, because they're not always true. In particular, Mendel concluded from his experiments that the two parents always make equal contributions to the character and that the effect of an allele is independent of whether it came from the female parent or the male parent. This is normally true for plants, it's normally true for peas, it's normally true for people. But there are some mammalian genes for which it is not true, and these are the imprinted genes. In genomic imprinting, which applies, as I said, to only a few particular special genes, it turns out that alleles inherited from the father are expressed differently than alleles inherited from the mother. And I'll illustrate that with this diagram here, showing the same two alleles in the father, two alleles in the mother, and alleles in the offspring. Now, if an allele is imprinted, it's been turned off in the copy that the offspring inherits from one of their parents. And for some genes, that turning off will happen to the allele from the father. That would be called paternal imprinting. In some cases, it will be the allele from the mother that's off. So I'll label these. Allele from the mother, allele from the father. In this particular case, we're showing that the allele from the father has been turned off. The sequence hasn't changed, but the DNA has been methylated so that it's not expressed. And the same is true for the parents. The allele that the father inherited from his father is off. Again, that's the allele he inherited from his father and from his mother. And in the mother, the allele that she inherited from her father is off. The allele that she inherited from her mother is on. Now, it doesn't matter what the identity of the allele is, what the DNA sequence of the allele is. All that matters is which parent it came from. So in this diagram, I've colored all four alleles in the parents different colors, as if they were four distinct alleles of this gene. And I've shown, again, that the allele the father got from his father is off, and the allele that the mother got from her father is off. In the offspring, the allele that the offspring got from their father is off. In this case, the allele happens to be the allele that the father had from his mother. It was on in him, but now he's turned it off when he passed it to his child. On the other hand, the allele that's been inherited from the mother is the allele that she got from her father and it was off in her, but the version that she passed on to her child, same sequence, different modifications, it's now on. This is hard to get your head around, I know, so we're going to work through some examples. So here's the maternally imprinted gene. Again, I've colored the four alleles different colors. And again, we have the allele inherited from the father and from the mother, from the father and from the mother, from the father and from the mother. The allele, because this is a maternally imprinted allele, it's a maternally off allele. That means that the allele that the father got from his mother has been turned off, and the allele that the mother got from her mother has been turned off. But the child's allele, again, the allele the child got from their mother is off. In this case, though, it was the allele that was on in the mother, 
because she'd gotten it from her father. And the allele that's off in the ch that's on in the child happens to be the allele that was off in the father. Doesn't matter whether it was off or on in the previous generation. All that matters is which parent was it inherited from. So here's a pedigree way of looking at it. So we can consider two alleles of a gene that controls, we could say it controls skin pigment, although that in general is not controlled by imprinting. And we're calling the alleles A1 and A2. The parents are homozygous for A1 or for A2. The children are heterozygous, but they're only expressing the A1 allele that they got from their father. They're not expressing the A2 allele that they got from their mother. And it's not because A1 is dominant to A2. It's because the only allele they've got that works is the A1 allele. The A2 allele got turned off when mom made her gametes. In paternal imprinting, now we can think about an allele that controls height, a gene that controls height. And the short father has the T1 alleles, the tall mother has the T2 alleles, one of which she got from her mom, one from her dad. The children are only going to express the allele they got from mom. So again, they're heterozygous, but the allele they got from their father has been turned off. Only the allele that they got from their mother is on, so both children are tall. Things to remember. The alleles behave perfectly normally in meiosis. Everything you learned in Module 7 still applies to imprinted genes. The meiotic mechanism doesn't care whether particular genes are methylated or not methylated. And the second thing is that the concept of dominance is effectively, it's pretty much meaningless for imprinted genes. And that's because imprinted loci even though they're technically heterozygous or homozygous, they've got two alleles, only one is expressed, and so we can say that they're functionally hemizygous. They're behaving as if they only had one allele. They only have one allele that has a chance to work, and so it doesn't matter what the relationship is between the two alleles. Dominance doesn't apply, and that's why in these illustrations I haven't written big T, little t, or big A, little a, because dominance is not relevant in conditions of imprinting. Now, this is really weird, right? Why would such a peculiar process have evolved in the first place? Why would mothers turn off some of the genes in the gametes they're giving to their offspring, and fathers turn off other genes in the gametes they're giving to their offspring? There's a good evolutionary explanation for this, and it's called parental conflict. Here's the titles of some research papers about the parental conflict hypothesis in imprinting. Genetic conflict in early development, parental imprinting in normal and abnormal growth. Intralocus sexual conflict can drive the evolution of imprinting. Endosperm imprinting, a child custody battle. Genomic imprinting in mammalian development, a parental tug of war. So this sounds pretty dramatic, tugs of war, custody battles over which genes are going to be expressed. Here's my take on what's actually going on in this hypothesis. Basically, imprinting is a way for the parent to send a message to the fetus telling it how much resources it should use. And this arises because the father and the mother have different interests in the success of their offspring. Both of them want their offspring to do well. They've put one complete set of their genes into their offspring, and the success of their genes depends on the success of their offspring. But the, the um, interests are slightly different because of who's doing the work of producing the offspring. Both parents are contributing the genes, but usually in mammals, it's the mother who's doing the actual physiological work of the pregnancy, of actually investing resources in these offspring. 
in most mammalian species, there isn't any parental care. And the father contributes only his genes, and then he walks away. So his interest is in having this pregnancy produce a healthy baby or a set of progeny that will do well in the next generation. That's all he cares about. He might not be around to father any more babies by this particular female. But the female participant in this mating has her other interests in mind because she needs to conserve some resources so that she'll be able to carry out future pregnancies. So you can think of imprinting as saying to the fetus, the mother is saying, grow well, but leave some resources for me and my future babies. The father's imprinting is saying, use all the resources you can get. Future babies, I'm not going to worry about them, I probably won't even be the father. So these are different messages coming to the baby from the different parents. And these messages are provided in the language of imprinting by turning on or off particular alleles. So in the father, the father turns on a gene called IGF2, insulin-like growth factor. This gene stimulates growth of the fetus. He turns off a receptor which reduces the effect of this gene. The mother does exactly the opposite. She turns off the growth-promoting gene and turns on the recept leaves on the receptor that reduces the effect of the father's growth-promoting gene. So you can see this as a tug of war. Both parents are manipulating how the genes will be expressed in their offspring to optimize um, growth of the next generation. As I said before, imprinting uses DNA methylation, the same cytosine methylation we discussed in the previous lecture. And the way imprinting is implemented is that when the germline is developing in the next gener in the new fetus, all of the inherited imprinting methylation is erased in the germline cells. The rest of the body maintains the methylation it inherited from its parents and expresses the imprinting. But the germline erases all of those signals and then creates new methylation that will be appropriate for whether this is the male parent or the female parent. A gene that's evolved to be paternally imprinted has sequence tags, the same sort of sequence tags that are recognized by um, transcription factors and other DNA binding proteins. It has a sequence tag that tells the de novo methylase, remember the de novo methylase creates methylation where it wasn't there before. In a gene that's going to be paternally imprinted, the de novo methylase is called in saying, if you're male, methylate this gene to turn it off before the gametes are made. If the person is female, some other genes will have a sequence tag that says, methylate this gene before you make ova, female gametes, to turn it off so that your offspring will get gametes in which this allele, your, the allele you're giving them is off. In general, imprinting has evolved to a state where the parents' interests are in balance. It's like a tug-of-war where both parties are pulling, but generally everything pretty much stays in balance. But imprinting can cause very serious problems if something goes wrong with the allele that should normally be active. So if the parent whose allele is not imprinted has a defective allele or a deleted allele, then the offspring, even though they, they're going to inherit an intact allele, but it's going to come from the imprinted parent. It'll be turned off. The only active allele they have is the one that doesn't work because of a mutation or a deletion. This is also a problem when both alleles are inherited from one parent. Even then, this is something that happens fairly often. It's a kind of chromosomal error that can happen through an error in meiosis or in very early cell divisions. And when this happens to a chromosome that contains imprinted genes, 
either neither allele will be imprinted and the uh, offspring will be expressing both copies where normally they would only express one or if the chromosome that they got two copies of comes from the imprinted parent both copies are going to be off and the offspring will have no functional copies being expressed. These are especially problematic for deletions and chromosomal changes like uniparental disomy because often imprinted genes are clustered together on one chromosome so that you don't just inherit a chromosome that's got one imprinted allele gone badly. Often you get several at once. Uh, an example of that is shown here where on chromosome 15, there's a large cluster of genes. It's about five megabases that contains genes that are both inactivated in the father and genes that are, no, genes that are expressed in the father, inactivated in the mother, and genes that are expressed in the mother, inactivated in the father copy. And this means that if a child inherits a deletion of this chromosomal segment or part of the segment from one parent, the phenotype will depend very much on which parent they inherited the deletion from. If they inherit the deletion from their father, they will get expressed copies of these genes not expressed copies of these genes, but because it's a deletion, they'll be missing these genes entirely. They'll be off in the copy from the mother and deleted in the copy from the mother. And that child will have a disease called Prader-Willi syndrome that's characterized by certain um, retardation behavioral problems, in particular excess eating, a very, very powerful appetite. A child who inherits the deletion from their mother will have the opposite problem, and they'll have a disease called Angelman syndrome, which in some ways has phenotypic characteristics that are the opposite of the characteristics with Prader-Willi syndrome. So now we have two problems for you to work through to help you come to grips with this concept of imprinting, and they both concern the same locus. But they're, one's a pedigree problem, one's not expressed as a pedigree. So in this first problem, you're told we're thinking about a locus called A. We've got two alleles, the normal wild type allele A plus, and a defective allele called A minus. If only the A minus allele is expressed, then there are medical problems. So in this particular situation, you're told that this affected man has genotype A plus and A minus. And the question asks, which allele is being expressed, and which parent did he inherit this allele from? And the answer is that the A minus allele must be being expressed, and that's because he's got the affected phenotype. Therefore, he's, we know he's only expressing the A minus allele. Who did he get his A minus allele from? Well, we're told that the locus is maternally imprinted. That means it's maternally off. So if he got the A plus allele from his mother, it's off. He got the A minus allele from his father. It's on, but unfortunately, it doesn't work. So he's got the affected phenotype. Here's the second problem, this time thinking about the same allele but expressed as a pedigree. And we've got two generations here, um, a pair of grandparents, one of whom, like the man in the previous problem, is heterozygous for A plus and A minus and is affected by this problem. She, this time it's a woman, her husband is phenotypically normal, they have a son and the son marries a phenotypically normal woman, and they're going to have a child. The question is, what is the chance that the child will be affected? So let's work through the steps in this problem. First, we're told that the allele is rare. 
So we can assume that the people who are marrying in are going to be A plus, A plus, A plus, A plus. This person is affected. We know that they're A minus. What's the genotype of this person? Well, we know they got an A plus allele from their father and that that A plus allele is expressed because the maternal allele, A something, they got from their mother will be turned off. So we can't tell from their phenotype whether they got the plus allele or the minus allele from their mother. So I'm going to write plus and minus and a question mark. So there's the probability of one half that they have a plus, and there's a probability of one half that this man has a minus. We can't tell from his phenotype. Now, again, the child is going to inherit a plus allele from their parent, their mother. It doesn't matter what allele they inherit from their mother, it's going to be off. The allele that they inherit from their father, they're going to express. What's the probability that they get the A minus allele from their father? Well, there's a 50% chance, P equals one half, that he has an A minus allele. And if he has it, there's a 50% chance that the child will get it. So that's one half times one half equals one quarter equals 25%. That's our 25% answer. So we've talked about imprinting, the process that turns off alleles depending on which parent they come from, either always from the mother or always off from the father. Usually this is accomplished by cytosine methylation. We also talked about why some alleles are given this treatment, and the best explanation is an evolutionary tug of war between the interests of the mother and of the father in the resources that are invested in the child. We talked about how imprinting causes genetic diseases, and we practiced following imprinting in pedigrees. Coming up next, we're going to talk about genetic chimeras. I hope to see you there.